because you know as a speaker you have to be a safe bet mm -hmm. right and so people can't depend on you to deliver a specific message you can't really build authority in any given space if you're trying to be everything to everybody and so i had to look at myself objectively and also understand that in order to get to where you want to be or if you have, you have to look like what you want to get paid welcome to the speak your success podcast Successors, welcome to another episode of the Speak Your Success podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and this is a platform to where we highlight entrepreneurs who are getting after it daily, and even further than that, who are encouraging and empowering so many others. And man, today's episode is unlike any other, right? Because we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to go back a little bit, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's guest. So, Will Baggett is a graduate of both the University of Mississippi and Baylor University. Baggett was named as a top 50 speaker in 2024 by Motivator Music, a former operations coordinator for the college football playoff, and former Division I performance coach, a three-time author, and a dynamic speaker who has, de de who has delivered over 300 keynotes. Welcome to Speak Your Success, Will. Hey, Jay Jones. I appreciate the opportunity, brother. Thank you for having me. It's just a pleasure to be in the space with you. I got to see your son coming in and, you know, whipping this little truck. He blew the horn at me a few times, right? So I didn't know if I was overstaying my, overstaying my welcome or not, but I'm so excited to be here and I'm appreciative for the platform you created. Man, I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate you saying that, man. Yeah, so let's go ahead and dive in, Will. Let's do it, man. Let's do it and dive in. Let's do it. So... I want to. I, I want to go ahead. I want to go ahead and kick this thing off. I want to talk about the book, man. Okay. Hughes, Hughes of Hope: A Colorful Journey Outside the Lines, yeah. right? I, I, I want. Let, let's go ahead and get into it. So, what what events occurred in your life to prompt you to write Hughes of Hope in comparison to the blueprint for a successful career? Yeah, man, that's a great question, and it's kind of a multifaceted answer. And one of the main reasons is because, well, to kind of even backtrack, I started writing that book in 2019. And it just came out a few weeks ago, right? So you're talking about a five-year process. But I'm one of those ones where I, I forgive myself, right? Because I'm one of the ones where I just, if I'm not feeling the creative juices flowing, I'm just not going to do it at that point in time. And so I got to a point where I had to kind of actually live the story out in order to make it what it was. And the book's title has changed at least six times, right? And so I always tell people, don't write the title first, right? That should be last because you never know what direction. As an author, you know how that goes. You never know what direction the spirit or where the, uh, where the curse is going to lead you. And so I finally kind of landed upon Hues of Hope, A Colorful Journey, because it kind of aligned with the whole rebrand I underwent uh, last fall after, I would say, six or seven years of kind of being, and I wouldn't say all over the place, but it's kind of one of those things where if you didn't know me and you were just kind of walking into a random store and you had a book that represented you know, different speakers, brands, or just personal brands, mine would have had all kind of crap on it, right? It would have had Will Baggett, the blueprint for a successful career. It would have had executive image. It would have had bag talk. And it's like, okay, what is the true narrative here? Like, what is he really doing? What's he really about? Because you know, as a speaker, you have to be a safe bet, mm -hmm. right? And so people can't depend on you to deliver a specific message. You can't really build authority in any given space if you're trying to be everything to everybody. And so while all those pieces were, a, were, I guess, in ways fragments of me or part of me, it, there was no vertical alignment or integration that would make a passerby just want to say, hey, I want to pick that up and see what it's all about. And so I had to look at myself objectively and also understand that in order to get to where you want to be or if you, have, you have to look like what you want to get paid, right? You know what I mean? You, want to, you have to look like what you want to get paid for or what amount you want to receive. And so... I had to undergo an objective look at my brand and I just looked at it and said, it's not good enough for where I'm trying to go. Mm -hmm. And so hired a branding expert, you know, and just kind of from start to finish, really just evaluated my life and what it was all about and what really fit. And there were some other experiences I had that um, we can talk more about. But one of the main life experiences, I think, that fueled me because I started writing the book in 2019 because uh, I've always been into creative writing and the blueprint was more on the professional development do this, do that, right? Very educational and kind of tactical. But I think in today's day and age with everything we've been through in the past years and what people are still going through, uh, seen and unseen, said and unsaid, I wanted to give something that was quick, easy, and inspirational 
And a lot of the actual stories in there actually are true. The ones that are the most outlandish are the ones that are true. <laughs> like the little natural happenings, those are things I had to, you know, I filled in to pad the story to make it make sense. But the the teacher galloping around the classroom on a horse head, that was true. It actually happened. Meeting a guy named Voice Williams in Atlanta, Georgia, that actually happened. So uh, it would really it was really again me living out the story. And I think the last thing what put the the bow on top was I was working as an associate teacher at a KIPP Truth School in 2021. Not many people knew that, right? And Lubbock Smith, shout out to Lubbock Smith, who helped me get that opportunity at a time where I really needed it. And I met a young man, uh, his name was Jalen. And what he would always do without fail, he's like a kindergartner slash first grader, without fail, he would always, when he got his coloring sheets, he would be all over the place, just outside those lines, right? He had no, it was like he was incorrigible. Like he just did not want to follow the standard, you know, status quo. And I began to observe him. And finally, one day, the teacher asked him. She was like, "Jalen, like, why can't you stay inside the lines?" And he said in the most this most direct and sweetest six year old voice I've ever heard, "It's not that I can't stay inside the lines. It's just that this paper isn't big enough for me to express myself." And that's when I thought about like, wow. You know, how many people have outgrown spaces, places, situations, people, and they're still occupying that space. And so he was basically kind of rebelling against that because he wanted more space and more freedom, more creative freedom to express himself. And Jalen taught me an important lesson that day. And that's the main reason why he was the star of the promo video that I put out for Hughes of Hope. That's the same kid from 2021. Wow, wow man. Yeah, and uh, I mean, as as I hear you, first of all, with the comparison between, you know, uh, Blueprint, more so along the lines of professional development, which I got when I read in the Hughes of Hope as I, as I finished it, and then I read it, I, I did feel the creative elements of it, and, and even picking up the lessons and the gems that you left for us, right? But but when, when we began to talk about outgrowing people, mm-hmm. right, I, I, I saw an interview that you had on the Good Leadership podcast and also in Hughes of Hope. Right. You, you made mention of the bus concept mm-hmm. and uh, with with you being a leader, how, how do you put people in the right position for your brand? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a part of it comes from my family origin. And so in my family, I'm a seven generation entrepreneur on my dad's side, dating back to my grandfather. And it goes all the way down, weaving through my uncles, down to my dad, down to my brothers and then to me. And my niece just became number eight. Uh, she started a soap company called Otter Soap Company. And so that is literally in our family DNA, right? And so for the first 12 years of my life and career, I was in the sports and entertainment world, obviously, and some of the things that you mentioned, and loved every bit of it and still have you know a, a, a toe or two kind of dipped in it and volunteering at different places. But I think the biggest thing was watching my dad over the course of my adolescence and growing up because he was a general contractor and he had to put everything in place in the right order for the house to be built successfully and for it to make sense. And so watching that, that's kind of where the blueprint concept came from, right? It was kind of an ode to him as a general contractor, but also just, you know, I think from a leadership standpoint, you may not know how to do every job. Like for instance, when I wrote the script for the Hughes of Hope promotional video, I couldn't tell you how to bring in the, the fade to black, dramatic music and all these different elements that made it made it a hopefully a gripping experience but i knew what i wanted mm. and i knew who could pull it together the same thing with the rebrand and so i think in some cases you have to really know what you're going after what feel what emotion you want to evoke and you have to collect the, the i guess the the business cards or collect the relationships that you need in order to be successful like for instance the young lady who played the, the voiceover in the video <clears throat> I met her at a at a at a black sports professionals conference about five months ago, and she was you know coming up and and she was in in one of my sessions I sp- uh, spoke at, and she just randomly mentioned like hey I do voiceover work if you ever need voiceover work and so that was six months ago at that point in time I wouldn't even plan on finishing Hughes of Hope this year at all, <clears throat> but when it came to the time to get it done and I wanted to put this video out I remembered her and her skill set and was able to kind of bring that in and so kind of the concept you mentioned is getting the right people on the bus and getting them in them getting them in the right seats similar to if like for instance when football teams division one teams or any division i'm sorry will fly out they have to balance the plane 
right, with the offensive linemen and defensive linemen. These are the big guys. You can't put them all on one side or the other because that that's not gonna that's not gonna work <laughs> not work out for you. And so I think about the same pieces when it comes to leadership is putting position people in position where they can su- be successful, <clears throat> where they can be empowered, where they can have some small wins, where they can grow their influence, grow their confidence. And the hope is that they go out and do their own thing, right? And, and as a leader begets other leaders, and that's what I wanted to do in, in anything I'm involved in is try to empower people to maximize their skill set at the highest level and also introduce them you know, to things they haven't seen because so much of what we miss and so much I think of you know underachievement that happens in our community, I think a lot of it's due to lack of exposure. Right? You don't even know it exists, right? And so if you can't see it, oftentimes you can't be it. And so when it comes to leadership, I think it's like, you know, the old saying, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way and shows the way. And doing my best to to put people in position every step of the way is how, how, kind of how I view leadership and how we get people on the bus and get them in the right seats. They have to be in the right seats to maximize their potential. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I like that. And, and, and also one thing about leadership is like disruption, right? Because leadership sometimes... Uh, the person who gets the results, they do things ways that are different. And, 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 and thinking, about, thinking about like we live in a world to where there's right and there's wrong. Uh, but according to society and, and hearing some of the concepts that you've shared, some of the interviews you sh- shared, you, you typically talk about things that are just different. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk more about that? Yeah, I, I believe, you know, I'm, I'm an unapologetic Christian, you know, shout, shout out to you with social Shout out to Social Dallas and, and Robert Murdu and my wonderful church family there. So uh, Christianity is what I identify with and I respect all religions and backgrounds. And, you know, the way I look at that is I don't there's not really many, if any, uh, religious doctrines that tell you not to be a good person and not to do unto others as you want to be you know, done unto you. Right. And so I, I make sure that I'm respectful and um, I honor other belief systems. Right. Because people have a right to worship and believe as they as they choose to. And so that's kind of what I you know kind of mean when it comes to different. Right. Because at the end of the day, I've seen the miracle signs and my wonders that make me have faith in my God. But I can't say that a person that believes differently hasn't seen some miracle signs and wonders that make them believe in what they believe in. Right. And I believe that the, you'll be the, the best Bible someone will read is by how you live your life. Right. And when it comes to being different, I think there is right and wrong when it comes to the lawful part of it, right? The legal part of it. And when it comes to the Ten Commandments, right? I think there is some lines you have to stay within, right? Contrary to my narrative of coloring outside the lines, right? Don't, don't go out and just start the purge. You know what I mean? Like you got to operate within because you got to have some structure and some order. But I think also when you become too rigid in your belief systems, it, 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 blocks you from learning from other people, right? It may not be something that you adopt, but it makes you more aware. And in the business that we're in as public speakers, we may have people that believe in God. We may have people that believe in that dog outside. And we gotta be be mindful of that and create a safe space for them of inclusivity that they feel that they are accepted no matter their belief system. And so part of that comes from being in the public sector um, and maybe having private sector belief systems. You have to be mindful of that while still being true to yourself and authentic to yourself. So the way that I look at it is being different, allowing things to be different. It allows you to grow, to understand, to expand. And that can be said for anything, not even just talking about the religious piece of it. If you think that, you know, the only way to get to five is three plus two, then you would block out four plus one or one point uh, one or one uh, plus four. So there's just different paths to get to the same destination. And that's what I believe in. It's just understanding and appreciating the power of differences and how they all make us grow. And that is what, and, and I hate the attack that's being put on the DE and I community, I mean, uh, world and the apartments across the country and, and people that are losing their jobs and losing their employment because it's no longer trendy, right? But the, the fact still remains, research shows that diverse, i.e. different, Groups of people tend to be more successful, have uh, more cohesive teams, and tend to make better decisions. And so when I think about different, I think difference, differences in a wide expanse of, of disciplines and institutions across, um, across the human experience. 
I like that, man. I like that. And as as we talk about different pathways, we're gonna we're gonna take a slight pivot over here. And and I, I met you what earlier? Well, I met you. I met you early in your speaking journey. Early. Yeah, I met you early in your speaking journey. That now. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you're a full-time speaker, right? Top, top speaker 2024 by, by Motivator Music. Uh, talk about your speaking journey then to now. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, I, I think the, the, the one thing about speaking is that it's always, a, it's always a marathon. It's definitely not a sprint because there are ways and improvements you can make after every single one. You have to kind of put in the videotape and just learn and get better, Video, figure out what, you, what your your quirks are, your idiosyncrasies, the, the things you say when, when you have gaps in speeches, like what, just kind of study the tape. And so I would say I've had 300 or so experiences to study the tape, right? And I always say, if you, if you don't, you're not gonna get to 10 until you get to one. You're not gonna get to 100 until you get to 50, right? And so I've appreciated every single experience from start to finish. And the, one of the biggest things was having the support along the way, because without people that believe in us as people or believe in the messaging, then there's really no, you don't really have, have a job, honestly, right? And so I, my mother is actually the person that booked my first speaking engagement for me in October of 2016. And it was, in, uh, it was at a church in Coffeyville, Mississippi. It was a youth day service, and there were six people in the room, my two parents, my third grade multi-age teacher, two teenagers, and a toddler in a stroller. And I will never forget my first audience, right? And I went back and watched that tape, you know, last year, and I was like, wow, you know what I mean? We've come a long way, but also there is a lot further to go. And so I just kind of have this, this mentality of it's never good enough. And that kind of comes from my strength and conditioning background. And that's what we were just kind of taught. And it's, it's, it's meant as a measure of motivation, but also understanding like being content, but not complacent. And sometimes people misconstrue the two, but they're, they have different yet, you know, there's some overlap there, but there's some different meanings they have. Like I'm content with where I am now, but I'm not complacent with where things are going and, and what I'm planning to do as I continue to grow and learn and study other speakers that have come before, before me and just listening and just being, someone that is is malleable, uh, understanding different approaches uh, in terms of how I interact with them, how I start, how I end. And it's just a never ending journey because you don't get a degree in speaking. It's your first amendment right, right? So technically anybody with a mouth and a voice and a US, US citizen is technically our competition, right? And so there has to be a greater degree of separation in how you prepare and execute your speeches because public speaking is the number one fear in the world to this day, right? It's above snakes, in-laws, everything. It's public speaking is the number one fear in the world. And those that overcome that fear are, have a great opportunity to make an impact because how many rooms do you walk in where they are more than 50 to 100 people and you're the only voice in the room, the only voice. Think about how many side conversations happen at networking events and all these different conferences. But how many times, how many chances do you get to be the only voice in the room? Like what a great opportunity and it's not to be taken lightly. So that's what I would say my growth journey has been is just continuing to hone the craft, watch the videotape and find ways to make a greater impact. So you represent one half of the brand Monetize Your Message. Can you tell us what that is and where you see that going? Yeah, absolutely. So Monetize Your Message was or is an initiative started by myself and co-founded by my business partner, friend, mentor, uncle, buddy, Darren K. Roberts. And when I tell you that me and that guy are tight, like we are tight, like airtight. And he was one of the first people to actually believe and reach out to me to come speak in 2017. So my one of my first gigs after my mom booked one in 2016, uh, my first paid one was in 2017. And it was a crazy story, kind of how I got there. But when it came to later on in the year, I was writing for front office sports at that time. I was a contributing writer and timing was huge on that opportunity. And Darren began to see my articles pop popping up and he reached out to me and he said, hey man, love what you're doing. Come speak to my class at the University of Texas, Austin. And I was like, man, I said, you have any like budget, anything like that? It's like, you don't have much money, but I can pay you mileage and I can buy you lunch. I said, okay, bet. <laughs> so I took it, right? Because at that point in time, I was all of like two, two and a half speeches in. 
And so like no job was too small at that point in time. It still isn't right. If it's the opportunity is right. And so we went down and knocked it out and he took some great photos of me and he really put me in position to look like I've been doing it for years. And I was only three, three speeches in at that point in time. And so the strategy he had, he put me on his podcast and was like, you're doing now. He put pictures and posted them on his Twitter and his other social media platforms. And I was able to put the UT brand, right, as a place I had spoken, right? Because as you know, in our in our space, optics are what create opportunities, right? And so we 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 been stayed in contact since that time. And then finally, I think it was 2022, and this was the first time that we had actually been in the same space speaking. We were at the Black Student Athlete Summit. I think it was Houston, Texas in 22, if I'm not mistaken. And we didn't know each other would be there. And so I'm backstage getting ready to go on. And Darren comes walking up. Now, mind you, we've been staying connected over the socials and maybe text every now and then. But we hadn't seen each other since 2017 in person. And here it is five years, almost five years later. Right. And so. We got to connect, and then after that, he followed up with me a, a month later. He was in like Costa Rica. I said, "Hey, bro, man, the speaking industry, the education out here is trash. We need to start a business." And within an hour, I had a Google Doc. Within three days, I had a logo, and the rest is pretty much history. So we had we had our first conference last year in in Dallas in, in Plano Legacy West. We hosted about forty individuals. And we'll have our second one this year, October 4th and 5th, and, and also in Plano at the Renaissance Hotel. And the biggest thing that we got from that, obviously we wanted to provide a great experience and do things the right way with integrity, not parade around celebrities and tell you how great we are, but give you tactical information that help, can help you grow your speaking career. Because what we did is we had our assistants go through and look at every single one of our competitors in the market and we basically had them do like some kind of mole operation and they broke down their entire business models from every platform they were using, every click funnel, every like every everything you could possibly imagine, drip campaigns, whatever it was. And we got we got basically a whole report on every single other competitor. Right. Even the ones that are household names, because you have to study the tape. You have to know what the market is, where it currently sits, what niche or what what space is available, right, for, for the infiltration. And you have to know how to attack it the right way to make sure you're creating some level of market segmentation or market differentiation. And that's what we did initially. And we had people came in, come in last year who have seen their businesses go uh, increase up to 60 70% just in terms of getting on stages and increasing their rates. It's just been so much fun to watch them but more importantly, they formed a community, like a true family, and to where now like three or four of the participants from last year are now working together, right? And working you know, for the same kind of same cause, right? And so seeing that manifest, it's not something we planned for, but it was all the more rewarding because it's one of those things where you want people to have a good experience, you want people to connect, and when people are spending their money and time and resources, you know, it, it helps when they have people that are in the same boat with them and that can relate to them. And uh, that's what we built Monetizing Message Upon was integrity, transparency, and giving people the actual tactics that we use to grow our speaking business and getting past the fluff. Because as you know, in the speaking world, it's like a huge black box, right? There's no like, you can't glass door it and see what the salary is, right? You can look at some Google averages, but it's not, it's not representative, right, of what's truly going on in the market. And so we cracked open the black box and we could tell that people were appreciative of that to the point where they said they spent loads of money on other resources and uh, some of even our competitors. And they said they don't know what they paid for. Right. And we wanted to make sure that we were going to be doing this with the right way, because in today's day and age, there are so many people that are making money not off what they do, but by telling you what they do. And so we wanted to make sure we were doing the work. Right. Showing showing our work. Right. Like you do it like you do in, in mad class. Right. And teaching people how to get the work. And that's what monetize your message is built upon. For for the aspiring speakers out there. Will, can you give us three steps? Like will be the first three steps to monetizing their message. The first step is tell people that you speak. 
Like it ain't rocket science, it ain't physics. When you meet people and you should be out at different events and places and spaces, tell people that you speak, right? But also within that, don't just say I speak, give them some context, some meat and potatoes, what you speak about, right? Because when you tell them I speak, well, the next question, the next logical question, oh, what do you speak about, right? So you can wait for that question or you can go ahead and say, I speak about X, Y, Z and not just leadership, give some context. I speak about leadership and transforming the mindset of people that want to achieve and go to great heights and inspire others to do the same, right? There, that gives you a greater conversation starter as opposed to, I speak about leadership, right? Now you're not building a relationship and you're not really giving them any line or any rope to grab onto, so to speak. Uh, the first thing I would say is tell people that you speak, right? Make sure it's present on every, you know, on your platforms and every way that you go, you're speaking that, right? You're speaking your, your success, so to speak. The second piece I would say is making sure that your brand is is sharp right now one thing i've done differently uh i don't post my speeches i i've posted like podcast stuff and some other like graphics and photos but you can't find a full like link speech of me talking anywhere on the internet and so i don't recommend that for everybody it's just something that i personally have chosen to do to try to build it a different way but I would say that your brand and how you market yourself is very important. So some steps I would recommend for the second thing, these are a few steps within the second question or second bullet point or kind of sub points is making sure that you are reminding people that you're, you're speaking. Because when you go out and speak, they don't know if it's paid or not. You just that you're just speaking. Right. So the optics is going to be is going to be very important. So making sure you're putting out graphics things of that sort and creative to show that you're speaking. Uh, the second piece is if it's not on camera, it never happened, right? Photography, videography, if it's not on camera, it never happened. You have to get those pieces. The next piece of it would be capturing survey, survey feedback. None of us are as good as we think we are and none of us are as bad as we think we are, right? So taking the survey feedback, reading the hard, take that's a hard thing, right? When that, that feedback don't come like you expected, but it's meant to make you better. They don't, I don't think most people are looking to sabotage anyone because they have to be there. They want a good experience. And so they're coming from an objective standpoint, as I like to believe. And so when I read that line, it says, it was good, but like, eh, you don't wanna keep reading, but you gotta keep reading, right? But within that survey, you're gonna have also glowing remarks, hopefully. Those glowing remarks become testimonials that you can use to your advantage, put in your LinkedIn recommendations or have them do it, put into a graphic, get video testimonials, all these different pieces. And then the last thing is having a follow-up process. Don't just let it fall flat. Having a follow-up process, whether it's a handwritten note, you can send an Amazon gift card in about 30 seconds, right? Just by typing in their email or cell phone number. And that's a follow-up process that you can implement, but then you gotta follow through. Once they acknowledge receipt of the, of the follow-up, then you wanna come back to them and say, hey, I'm glad you received the gift. Is there anyone in your network you recommend that my message might be good for. And so you basically have kind of closed the loop and now you're able to kind of stretch this content instead of going from one post about a speech to having having the pre-speech content, behind the scenes content where you're actually on site, Instagram stories or things you may share on LinkedIn or Instagram or Twitter, whatever it is. And as you're getting the photos and videos later on, because it, it never happens right at the same time, you can post more content at a later time and so now you're taking this content you're stretching it right and you got this you got the testimonials and you got all these different pieces of content and that you may stretch that over the course of a few weeks you may even put some in the kitty for later when things are slow so you still have the appearance and optics that you're booked and busy you know to be honest with you and then the third thing i would say is after having all those pieces make sure you have your your business house in order so for instance uh, I didn't have a website, and if I was smarter or I had more money, I probably would have had one earlier. But I couldn't afford a website when I first started, so I didn't have one. And so I got creative and found Adobe Spark page and other different ways to kind of, you know, showcase my brand. But you need to have your one-sheeter. You need to have your business house in order, whether it's your LLC, your DBA, having your W-9 ready to go. Uh, some people require insurance for speakers, which is which is wild. And making sure you have that house in order because what we do is a, it can be lucrative, it can be high revenue, but there's not a lot of deductions after you get past the travel piece and maybe some systems you may use. 
you you still should be at probably a pretty high net net margin in terms of profit. And so if you are not tracking things or don't have your house in order or even have other pursuits outside of speaking to help uh, lower that taxable income, then it's going to be tough for you as you get further in this industry to uh, to really maintain because Uncle Sam's going to come get his. Right. And so that's those things I would say. Um, just having having the having the brand and tell people that you speak, you know, get your get your branding you know, in order and make sure you get your business in order as well and have it at a drop of a hat. You shouldn't be searching around and fumbling around trying to find things because business moves at the rate of responsiveness. Right. And so it moves at a very fast rate. And so when people reach out to you, they want what they want when they want it. Right. And if you let things go by and a day passes, another day passes. It's called the law of diminishing intent, right? We heard law of diminishing return, but over time, the law of diminishing intent creeps in to not like, ah, never mind, I found somebody else, right? And so you have to be responsive and you have to be quick. And so when I get a speaking request, they, my average probably is like 30 seconds and they got a response in their inbox because they can move to someone else. Because like I said, theoretically, everyone's our competition. So you have to be able to create some, some separation by your responsiveness by your relationships and also by how you set your your business up and your your branding house in order. That's a good game, Will. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. Come to platform. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. Come to platform, <laughs> right? That ain't even that ain't even level one. That's level point five. Come to platform. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so you talked about speakers uh, having other uh, other forms of revenue, right? Um, and I see you. Uh, I see you're in the commercial real estate space, right? Uh, what was your introduction to, to, to what was your introduction to that space and how did you first get your feet wet? Yeah, absolutely. So I've done a lot of random stuff in my life. I, that's not much I haven't tried. So I actually bought a, a gym franchise in 2019 uh, called Nine Round Kickboxing and went through the whole process, bought the franchise, and it was scheduled to open in March 2020. And you all know what happened in March 2020. And so I ended up selling that to get out of that and, and avoid bankruptcy. But... I just really enjoyed that process, going through it. And there's a thing called an FDD, a franchise disclosure document. Mine was 216 pages, right? Basically, start to finish, things you could do, couldn't do, what have you. I enjoyed getting the business loan, the SBA 7A loan. I just enjoyed it. Like, I, I love building things. Like, I enjoy building things more than I like seeing them actually produce. Because, you know, once the book got done, I was like, hey, what do I do now? I'm bored, right? So I went and started something else the other day, right? I mean, so the commercial real estate space, you know, ownership is is your biggest generational as passed down, right? Whether it be ownership of information, intellectual property, physical property, whatever you want to call it. It's not just what you leave to people, but what you leave in people. And so getting that knowledge and realizing that not many minorities are in the commercial real estate space and franchising is just one, one element of it. There are other ways to get into it. I want it to be a conduit to help people understand that commercial real estate is not much harder than buying a home. It's not, it's, there's not much difference, right? It's just a different lane that doesn't reach our community as much. And frankly, most of the people or brokers that are in commercial real estate don't look like me and you. And it's a very quiet kept industry. So anything that doesn't, that, that everybody's not into, and when people are not talking about it much, that's where the bag is. Right. And so you have to skate to where the puck's going to where the puck is going to quote rank Wayne Gretzky. And so I wanted to be in that space to be able to have that knowledge and information because there are so many and I can't get into it now because it would be a whole different episode. But so many tax benefits in terms of depreciation, accelerated depreciation that were put to help people. And like you look at all these office buildings now that are vacant. People should the people are saying, wait, why don't you just turn those into apartments and make it affordable? you know, rental, uh, rental apartments uh, that doesn't help them because they're getting depreciation off of it. Right. Or as it is. So for them, it's just it's an it's an it's a kind of a liability, but it's kind of an asset as well because of depreciation, because when you get a commercial space you, and you buy into a commercial space, you can depreciate the 80 percent of that over 27 and a half years. You can depreciate that on your taxes for that amount of time or you can take it in five years or you can do accelerated depreciation in year one. And you can probably get a tax refund check, right? That's that, it's a it's a different game, and so when people are wondering why you know some of our our people in our country don't pay as much in taxes, well, it's all legal because when the, you know how you walk into a classroom and the teacher 
If the professor wrote the book, wrote the textbook, you know what time it is? Okay, you see where I'm going, right? The founding fathers wrote this textbook and on commercial real estate for a reason to benefit them. And so we have to play a different game, right? If you wanna really you know, be among the, the real players. And so that's what I wanted to do. And also, if I'm being honest, my dad built houses, or still builds houses to this day. I've uh, been in for 40 years. I mean, it's not much I don't know about a house in, in terms of building one. But when it comes to my schedule and how much I travel, I did not have time. People be calling me talking about, I didn't like the bathroom. Can we go see five more houses? Like, nah, I'm good. Because that's that wouldn't work for my schedule because of how much I travel. And I wouldn't be able to maintain like ground with my competitors because I'm not always here in Dallas, right? And so with commercials, a lot more black and white. Like, okay, here's the building. Bathroom's on the right, sign here, right? Whereas residential is a lot more emotional, right? I don't like the bathrooms. I don't like the staircases. The kitchen's too small, right? You know, you have some of those things in commercial, but it's really more so based on, it's based on location, but there's also things like anchor tenants, like if a Target's nearby or a Walmart's nearby, it's called an anchor tenant. And so you know you're gonna get that vehicular traffic coming through because they bring in thousands of people every single day. Uh, also, you like your frontage space, how much frontage, frontage space do you have? What's the parking look like? You know, there are a lot of different elements. Also, the, the, the rent or what it's gonna cost per month to maintain uh, that property. There's a lot of different elements you have to take into account, but it is not a difficult process uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that people haven't been exposed to it, and so we often fear what we don't know and don't understand. Man, that was, a, that was like a half master class right there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's deep. Man, it's deep. man. Okay, so we hit on, hit on the commercial real estate. Now, now I want to kick over to the commercial actor aspect. Mm -hmm. And you once memorized the 90-minute movie, Street Fighter, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and your father said something was either really wrong with you or something was either really right with you. What was your interest in theater uh, or acting? Man, I would say this first, before I jump into that, I appreciate the research that you've done because you, you'd be shocked at how many opportunities I have like this and people don't know nothing about the person they're talking to. I'm the same way. I like to research and know what I'm going into. So I just want to appreciate you know, you and taking the time to do that. Thank you for that. I want to say thank you. Shout out to my producer, Brittany Lucky. Shout out to her. Shout out to her. We did it together. Shout out to her, though. Love it. So uh, the commercial acting space, you, you mentioned that, you know, that was, the, that was the story. I literally memorized it from start to finish. And it was something I just enjoyed because I just enjoy the delivery. But also for me, I'm an introvert who does extroverted things. And so that allows me to get into character, right? Same as when I get into speaking. I have to flip a switch and get into a different character because my natural personality or I, I've been told I'm very nonchalant more often, than, more, more often than not. And that doesn't work on stage in front of hundreds of people, right? And so you have to be able to channel a, a certain character and it's not something that's not authentic to you it's just having different tools in your tool belt and so when it comes to the commercial acting side i came up mostly doing like theater stuff and when we met in atlanta i was doing stuff on the side with like plays and things like that and with theater i really enjoy theater because it's one shot one kill there's there's no do-overs in live theater right you got to do what you got to do same as when it comes to speaking right there's no do-overs it is what it is at that point in time when it comes to film, though, and I've kind of gotten more into the commercial acting space uh, um, in the last six to seven months, it was kind of like I took like a long break. I hadn't done anything on camera and film or acting for that matter, probably in about six or seven years, right, since I left Atlanta because the scene for actors in, it, in Dallas is not as big as it is in Atlanta. It's out here, but you got to kind of find it, though, right? You got to bob and weave a little bit to find them, right? And so when I found the opportunities or found and I got an agent, I went to a talent convention last year in Los Angeles and, and went through that whole process. And I wanted to get coached because we always say elite people want to be coached. And yeah, I've been doing the public speaking thing, but is that going to go over well on film? Right. Because the projection and how you speak on a stage is not exactly how you're going to deliver on camera to make a connection to the viewer at home. Like theater and film are very different, right? In terms of how you shoot and, and how you deliver lines and how you build a connection, you know, with the audience and with the camera, right? So when I got back into it, yeah, I started off, didn't really, get much, didn't, really get, didn't really get many opportunities, but my whole approach to life is the old Jim Rohn quote. It says, don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. And so again, went, went and found someone that does self-taping, 
Uh, and I started taping auditions. I started getting coached, taking the feedback, not doing it the way I wanted to do it, but doing it the way that the pro suggested and started booking more things. And again, I'm, I'm background, so I'm, I, I'm a low budget actor. I do background work, but I enjoy it. And it's a lot of fun. I've had a great opportunity to be on different sets, but I've also learned how to produce my own stuff as I've done with my own content by being on those sets, right? And watching how they do it and how they shoot and how they cut and edit. And to give you some background, like your favorite TV show, whatever it is, a 30 second segment in your favorite TV show, a 30 second segment, just 30 seconds of straight, straight content probably took one and a half hours to shoot because of all the resets and like, oh, your hair was over, over your, over your like left eyebrow just a little bit. Let's move it back. Reset. Or it's like, oh yeah, I noticed that the fork was out of place. It wasn't in the same place it was in in the last scene. Or uh, put the fork down, reset it. I mean, it's, it's that detailed. Like I worked in operations and sports for 12 years. It doesn't come close to the detail that's on set, right? Because people are at home watching and looking for stuff literally sometimes when it's not in place. And so uh, the acting space has been fun and it's something I just love to do and love to, to be on set in, in, the, in the moment and uh, looking to hopefully grow it. So go from the background to the foreground one day, but I'm content with where I am, not complacent, and we're growing every day. But to get to where I wanna be, it's gonna require just coaching and getting better and uh, just getting to that next level. So that's what that's been in my experience so far. So you say from the background to the foreground, so what, what does that end goal look like? What, just just talk, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, you know, honestly, you know, I never wanted to be famous. I wanted to be impactful in the sense that it's kind of like when you think about when you go uh, and when I, when I think about it when you and you're like Jamie Foxx famous you can't go anywhere you can't do anything right because you get bombarded by people I don't want to live like that right um, I want to be able to deliver and expire experiences the same way I do speaking the same way I do when I was working as a teacher the same way I've done and in, in trying to put people into commercial buildings to change their life for me, my core is about human development and inspiring experiences, right? And so if I can deliver a performance that's going to say, hey, that was inspirational or that was memorable, that's really what my goal is, right? Because I don't want to be in a position where I can't go anywhere and enjoy life and, and have privacy, right? So that's what I would say is kind of the delicate balance that I, I'm trying to just maintain. Um, but wherever, you know, God takes me is, is, is where we'll go. But at the end of the day, I love the art form. Like the art form is what's most important to me first. And being able to, to, to get into character, to, to deliver at a high level, that's the part I enjoy the most. The rest of it would just be just kind of the after effects um, that would come from you know achieving whatever level of success. But my goal this year was to book two commercials. I've done like seven. And so you know we've already exceeded the goal. And so it's now it's like, okay, I wasn't dreaming big enough. Right. I wasn't I, I put limits on myself because I had started applying last year and really didn't get any opportunities. So I'm just like, OK, let me set the bar kind of low. You know what I mean? So it's easily achievable. Right. You know what I mean? I have to set it higher. Right. And so in speaking this now, by saying this verbally, it is creating a level of accountability to myself and being this being this being recorded to where I have to go out and do what I said I was going to do now. Right. And that's what I talk about all the time I'm talking to people, the difference between the language you speak. So when you say, I need, I might, I gotta, I have to, that in a way sounds like, it's like, like laborious in a way. Whereas when you say, I get to, I have an opportunity to, I am, I will, that sends a different signal to your brain and it's gonna help you really you know, push forward in your execution of whatever goal you've stated. And so I try to be very careful about my language and the words that I speak because, you know, death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? And so I wanna make sure I'm speaking positivity, not limiting uh, myself to anything, but also understanding that, hey, there's where, there, there are people that are in position because they put in the work, right? And so uh, just not thinking that you're deserving of some special treatment or opportunity when you haven't put any of the work in. And I'm, I'm far below having put 10,000 hours in to this craft, but but I'm excited for the challenge. I like that. I like that. We're gonna get ready to wrap, wrap this thing up. 
Uh, Will, but how does how does it feel for you to know that you've inspired over fifty thousand people? You know, honestly, man, I think sometimes, and I think this this goes to any people, any any group of people. So, for instance, we'll never see the true impact or true extension of our impact, right? There are people you've spoken to. There are people that listen to this podcast that you may ne- may not ever meet, may not ever listen to, ever speak to. I mean, I ever crossed paths with, but it could have been something you said, did, posted, and made their day better. And so I, I don't think we'll ever know the true extension of our impact. And so that's kind of a rough estimate based on how many you know, rooms and people I've spoken to. But the impact, I hope, is much greater than that. I mean, I hope the impact is 3x, 4x, 10x, right? You know, press down, shaking together and running over. You know what I mean? That's That's the hope is that it's far greater than that because... If it only went from my mouth to their ears and it stopped, then I don't know if it was good enough to really for them to actually want to share it and to keep it keep it moving. Because when you share something that you both you, both of you all receive something, you and you receive something in consciousness because you are beginning to embody that thing to where you can regurgitate it and say it more and you begin to be and become that thing. Right. And when you're sharing with the other person, they're now being introduced to it. And so they begin to embody it, embrace it, you know, and 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 learn it, and and be able to pass it on as well. And that's what I, I hope it has been. I hope it's been far greater than that. But it is a great responsibility that I don't take lightly, and that's why I take the preparation and the execution very seriously. And you know, it's one of those things where I, I was talking to some friends last night. It's not just we get up and just start talking, right? The the I read over a hundred books on people and how to how to study people and body language and how to how to how to connect with people and understanding the difference between you know different audiences in your audience you don't really get a full survey or full kind of report of how they learn and so you have to make sure you have different elements within your presentation to address their learning preferences so for instance you have some people that are auditory learners some that are visual learners and some that are kinesthetic learners Right. And so I try to cluster the major concepts and themes I have in my presentations to 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 really reach each learning style, because they may have missed the visual part of it. They may not have connected on the auditory side of it, but the kinesthetic application of it, that may be what what, what really grabbed them. And so I have to make sure that as a speaker, as a presenter, as a public servant, that I'm not just communicating how I want to communicate but I'm basically communicating in a way they want to receive the information. And that's the, that's the major difference between someone that gets up and talks and an actual presenter. Because I think speakers and presenters are different, right? Everyone has the ability to speak. You can get up there and throw a slide deck and start talking. But presenters have a way of, of crafting a message that will inspire action in a way that is seamlessly integrated into the, the human experience. Right. And so you have to be able to do that to be able to present and be able to leave a lasting impact because, you know, you could have someone you can give someone your whole slide deck tomorrow. They're not going to do it like you do it. Right. Same thing with myself and same thing with anyone else that has a special craft that's particular to them or their intellectual property. Right. My dad used to always say, he says, son, I've forgotten more than you ever know. And so that's kind of, you know, what I like to do in terms of, you know, how I go about my craft, how I prepare how I study and how I, I learn and and how I continue to try to get better with every single talk. As you might be listening to this audio version of the podcast or you might be watching even the video version of the podcast and you're probably thinking, well, what would it take for John to come to our campus? What would it take for John to come to our school and to teach our students media training, to talk about podcasting and even the whole world of media? Well, luckily for you, all you have to do, friend, is just click the link just down below in the show notes where it says book John to speak. All right. And then we can go right there. We can set up time to have a conversation. And I would love to learn more about you, love to learn more about your student athletes and how we can serve and support them at a high level. OK, so just hit the link just down below and we look forward to having a conversation with you. And lastly, Will, so one, one question I always like to ask people. Right. I always, I'm, I'm personally curious. Right. This is a question I, I like to call who's coming to dinner. So if you had the opportunity to invite three people for you to sit down, and have a conversation with living or dead, who are these three people be? 
You know, I would say, I think the easy, the easy answer is a uh, Lord and Savior, right? But he left such a wonderful guide for us to tap into. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that he's always with us, you know, regardless. So I'm going to go off, off the off the rail, rails a little bit. I'm going to say one person I want would want to have the, uh, on my uh, at my dinner table would be Jim Rohn. I, I think one of the greatest speakers to ever touched a microphone, like bar none. Like, and you'll hear a lot of his stuff in today's speakers if you listen to them what they're saying. Right, some of your favorite speakers got their stuff from Jim Rohn. Right, just go, just go research it. So Jim Rohn definitely. Uh, secondly, I want my grandfather there, my my dad's side, uh, just because he was the one who started the entrepreneurship chain in our family, as far as I know, and he was known as one of the the best concrete finishers in North Mississippi in his day, and he was also a pastor, and he also had uh, twelve rental units in in Grenada, Mississippi, where I'm from. And they actually named the street after him. And it stands to this day. It's called Baggage Drive. And he did all of this without Instagram, TikTok, or internet. Right? What a, like, 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 what a, what, I, mean, I just want to talk to him and say, like, Papa, how'd you figure all that stuff out? You know, and I'm sure he's going to say, you know, relationships, but still, though, to go against the grain and as a black man and do those, those kinds of things and the, you know, in the 60s and 70s and civil rights is not far removed. Right. You know, I, I'm just amazed by what he accomplished. And he started he started it. And I, I'd like to talk to him. And I think the third person would be my buddy, uh, Anthony Mays. So Anthony Mays was a guy I worked with at Walmart in the Garden Center. And he 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 was someone that always had a smile and was always positive. And he also, he's actually who the book is dedicated to, this one, Hughes of Hope, from my late friend Anthony Mays, who inspired us to make a big play every day of our lives. You know, he was actually, um, he, he was on dialysis the, the entire time we worked together when we were at Walmart. And so he would go in for his treatment. He could only work about 16 to 20 hours a week because he's on disability. But every time I will come out to the garden center, every day I'll go to work. And I'm in college at this point in time, right? I'm a sophomore in college headed to my junior year and worked there for three years and he worked there with me the entire time but every time i would i would come out to garden center and i would say hey what's up maze and you know and just and just connect with him he would always say man shoot man i'm gonna make a big play you know what i mean every single day and you know and, and he was a he, he was a father and he actually passed away in 2018 um you know i miss him dearly but i just never forgot the importance the, and, what, and how he stressed making a big play every day of your life. And so he's one, someone inspired me because despite his situation, what he was going through and what he was dealing with, he still had hope. Right. And, and I don't think I think hope isn't a strategy, but hope is a necessity. And what they'll what they what they say is. So when you look at there's parts of the world that are called blue zones. Blue zones are parts of the world outside, even just outside of the U.S., all across the globe, where people have the longest lifespans. They live the longest in these places. And so the uh, Harvard Business Review actually read a book. Um, there was a strategy, um, Harvard Business Review book, and it talked about how these people were studied to understand, like, why do people live so long? So the obvious answers were diet and exercise, like just keep it honest. Right. Those are two critical elements that help them live long, and healthy lives. But the third element may surprise you. It said that they woke up with a sense of hope and purpose every single day that they got up in the morning. And that was the third key element to living a long and prosperous and healthy life. And so that, among other things we talked about, is what inspired kind of the name Hughes of Hope. Because if you don't have hope, you know, you honestly, you pass away. Because a lot of people pass away mentally and spiritually before they ever pass away physically. So you have to maintain hope every day of your life. Man. Well, thank you, man. Appreciate the opportunity, brother. Brother, thank you for joining us, man, on, on Speak Your Success. Please let the people know uh, where they can find where they can find your new book, Hughes of Hope, yeah. right? Where they can find a new book, Hughes of Hope. Absolutely. And then also where they can connect with you on social and everything like that. Absolutely, yeah. So the Hughes of Hope book is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can get it by Pigeon. We'll drop it off. It don't matter. Like it's available everywhere. I can also send you a signed copy if you would like one. Uh, I'm on so all social media platforms is either Will Bag It 
or one bag talk with two G's. And I just want to just give my you give give flowers to a, a wonderful host and Jonathan Jones, speaker, author in his own right. Right. And I just want to spotlight you for everything that you accomplished and the impact you had you, you're having and how you're leading your family. It's admirable. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Man, and to all the successors out there, remember, 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 speak your success, believe in your greatness, and continue to create the life and business of your dreams. Why would you and why should you live any other way?